Okay, welcome everybody to Fledgling Talk, episode 9, the very, very occasional podcast show, whatever, where uh, we talk about all the fun stuff that might or might not be happening with the ultimate game that's the ultimate fun times. With me is Luke Spooner, my brother, and uh, he and I have been talking about stuff. There's a few videos I think we did together. I have been on this podcast before. Yeah. In various states. My my favorite one I attended was I was sitting on the balcony of a hotel in Arizona after sleeping for three hours, and we were chatting about fledgling. Fantastic. <laughs> Good times. I'm really excited to hear about, uh, you said you had a bunch of um, uh, pictures and uh, AI-generated stuff and some of your own renderings and kind of mapping those onto the different games and talking about more detail what the vision is. And I'm really, I'm really excited about that. Sweet. Well, let's jump right into it. So this is, you've seen this before, but to anyone who hasn't, awesome. uh, Fledgling one of my is... favorite chart. Yeah, it's so fun. favorite charts that I've seen. Um, and not just about Fledgling, it's just like, it's such, a, it's such a tight Venn diagram, and all of these, of course, resonate so well in the little neural circuitry. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, uh, Fledgling is a concept game. Uh, it's a concept for a concept game, which is the... Uh, a way for AI to interact with the world, a way for AI to, to model the world, basically. Um, and I thought it was appropriate to have AI generate some images of what it, these games might look like. So Fledgling's right there in the middle. You can see there's Fledgling, and then around it are all of these other kind of facets of the uh, Fledgling idea. And underlying this whole thing is procedural generation. So that the core idea of all these Fledgling things is uh, instead of having human people author a bunch of specific content, you teach the computer how to make the content, and then it can make an infinite amount and variety of content uh, for human players and also for AIs that are being trained on this kind of thing. So uh, Fledgling, of course, we don't have any images of Fledgling itself, um, hopefully eventually, but we do have some of the outside ones. So Luke, what, which one would you like to start with? I've got, I've got stuff of all of these plus some bonus images of Jackal Star, which isn't on this diagram because it's kind of like a, an underlying procedural generation game. So what, what do you want to start with? I think, I think I'd like to start with Star Sage. I think that's the one I'm most familiar with. Yeah. All right, let's see. We're going to look at... Uh, we're going to start here. Oh, there we go. So this is Star Sage. Point. Yeah, isn't that fun? So, so Star Sage, the idea is um, kind of magic. If we go back to our our image here, uh, it's got kind of some some magic kind of stuff, but it also has to do with world generation and space time, space travel, um, maybe a little bit of economics and trade. It, it, it's not really on that side of the the diagram, but there may be some of that stuff in there. Um, this kind of plays into. Uh, space Ace slash, uh, what is it? Uh, space Wheat, I think. Um, space Wheat. The Space Wheat was over in the economics and trade space that kind of moved its way down. But it's, it has nothing to do with the, the consciousness and attention thing. It's just, it's like a the procedural generated spaceships was my hope for Space Wheat, where we can have these proc gen worlds of doing uh, abstract trade. Um, and then over here, the, the Star Sage side of it was, my, my understanding was it's the, it's the first person, instead of the, the, the global view of this space wheat uh, empire that's living and breathing without you, Star Sage really focuses on the, the individual's perspective into a space. And they are trying to navigate and transit themselves through a series of, of puzzles in it, it, but not like necessarily puzzles and like uh, fiddly bits where we open up the train car in a point and click adventure way. Right. But more, which I would love to incorporate. <laughs> right. It, that's the fledgling thing. It's like, it's like everything is in everything. But yeah. But more in the idea of like I am in this spot and I want to be over there and I have I have magic and really odd ways of thinking. We, a lot of these games have rely enormous amount on spatial reasoning and being able to flex spatial reasoning puzzles. And I think that's like a big part of, to me, what Star, Star Sage is about, with all the, the shape-based uh, teleportation and transit and hyperspace being in different type of configurations and like uh, transforming oneself and like that be able to, to move oneself or other things around and then trying to like work through this, the uh, kind of an, it's one of the more optimistic, idealistic spaces 
as far as I, I thought of. Anyway, uh, yeah, so that's that's what my thoughts of Star Sage. I think this sounds like exactly the type of thing that I would love to wander through while we're trying to figure out how to get the wheat somewhere. Right, yeah, how to, how to get the stuff from some place to another place. So, so one of the prompts in this was uh, teleporter antennas, because that was kind of part of the thing is like, mm-hmm. Uh, moving things from one place to another, but you can't just move anything. You have to; it has to be in the right shape, or it has to be made of the right material, or something, and it has to resonate with the the location. So you'd have like you know, your materials and your minds and stuff, and then you have to shape the metal on site into these specific shapes that can teleport easily into orbit, so you can build your spaceship. That kind of thing. And uh, I realized while I was making these images that there's a lot of here. We'll go to the next one. Here's another kind of fields. Uh, star sage yeah. kind of feeling thing and, and again like the upper right hand corner is going to have a much stronger interface connection in a magical sense to the prior page whereas the left two here up and above is like these two like they they have similar shapes that they're using and thus like we might be able to more easily uh trans not transmit transmit data and transmit objects yeah kind of this space because the the shape of the object is its own dimensional space and it's like these two are very close to each other in dimensional space actually that's kind of it that's to me the summary of star sage's magic mechanic is that what if uh in in distance in practical energy distance between two objects the shape of the thing mattered much more than its actual physical distance it's location space. yeah it's measured yeah what if it's what if its form was more important than its location like and then the idea is like so then we can transmit and the idea is like i don't know uh, to me like the, the center of each city is the same center as all the other cities that are of that type yeah or, yeah but there's also all this stuff. magic so so there's like all of that spatial stuff but then i also wanted to i realized when i was when i was playing with these ideas of like trying to explore visually the space that there's a lot of kind of anime like i think i think star sage is the most anime inspired of the of the yes. fledgling facets and so there's like all the magic is oh. is like layers and it's all these big uh, kamehameha uh, spirit balls from Dragon Ball Z kind of thing. Right, um, right. You could you could very easily like and we talked about like like DDR. You could you could play it like DDR where you're like throwing out all the different like shapes and combinations of magic and you're trying to counter and defend by doing counter spell that's specific towards that thing. So yeah, to- yeah. And like different, there are different races of these fantasy creatures or whatever. And so, like, I tried to do um, some stuff of like the swamp people, like in the core of the spaceship or something. And so they've, I don't know. We we had talked about that yeah. a little bit. I don't know if we explored that yeah, very much, absolutely. but absolutely, yeah. No, like the the because there's a there's a lot in Star Sage about the the internal space versus the external space. Yeah, and there's all, like all this mitigation, and the idea is the internal space. They're trying to maximize to match your own person or your own community or whatever it is that's the swamp Mm -hmm. and then the outside of the space you're trying to like create a uh maximize for whatever function you're trying to do yeah and thus that which might change from location to location like the the external uh envelope right right, is match the environment and then the internal envelope is matched the to the participants or the the inhabitants And, and the game of the magic is is some the crafting that translation piece how do we how do we translate and like move the swamp while well, maintaining the information? And, like it's like so it's a compression and decompression game. Yeah, and yeah. Like, oh yeah, this is great. So then there's yeah there's the the um more like so there's the masculine and feminine spaceships too. I was kind of thinking like the feminine spaceships build stuff and the masculine spaceships like destroy them. You know that kind of simplistic sure. but but evocative uh, imagery. So this is, I don't know what this in the bottom right-hand corner is. It looks like some sort of snow globe with a nebula inside, but it's cool. Yeah, nebulas are fantastically, uh, well, the, one of the largest birthing structures, I suppose. Oh, there you go. It, it works. <laughs> Midjourney knew what I was trying to do. Uh, here's some more kind of like sphere spaceship stuff. Yeah. Uh, I really like the bottom right-hand corner with the nested shaping. Yeah. Right? It's like, Yeah. And then layers and layers. We were talking about unfolding, like you like you have the your cruisers are launching a missile at each other, mm. and you have layers and layers of of these of 
shapes magic spells inside magic spells right so you kind of rip off the shell after shell after shell before it makes impact or whatever yeah yeah Yeah. reconfiguring your shield layers so that they're in the right order so it's like a puzzle a real-time puzzle right to like get your shields in the right Right. order so that it nullifies the the magic spells that comes toward you or whatever so yeah layers layers and, and nesting is also a big part of of fledgling as a whole this kind of fractal idea uh we can't talk too long on this stuff because we've got so much to get to, but here's some more like swamp people uh, kind of imagery. Oh, I was, sorry. You're thinking, I, uh, you're you're also talking about space wheat and I'm like now seeing these in the space wheat idea, we have those three different things, the high structured civilization kind of yeah. Oh yeah, like yeah. armor in between and the druidic uh, chaos aligned uh, magic space over on the, on the other side of the spectrum. Right. And it's like bottom left hand corner is like uh, kind of an evil aligned druid, and I feel like that upper left hand corner is like you no, know, it's just it's just crazy. But it doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean villainous; it's just druidic, right? But, it's just some other thing. I I kind of like this. You know, what is this like a mech sl- slash um, swamp beast or something in the bottom right hand corner? Anyway, right. there's so much stuff. There's so much stuff to look at. Here's some more like swamp uh, tech images. I kind of feel like the bottom right one here is is kind of yeah. what I was going for with like the the um, the power core, the spaceship run off of the swamp ferries or something, and like each one of those little glass things would have a swamp ferry in it or something. I don't I don't know exactly, but I don't remember that specifically, but I love it. <laughs> uh, also, the bottom right feels to me to be I have this terrarium aspiration, and that's going over the the glass and the mossy. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So uh, some more like robots. Uh, Originally, I was thinking that all the characters would be robots in in Star Sage, and then like the 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 reason that they are robots is so that they can move their limbs in order to reconfigure themselves, so that they can teleport and do magic and stuff because of the shape thing, right? So they're they're doing all these like poses, these you know, uh, martial arts kind of stances. Um, but Mid Journey likes to make people, so it added a bunch of people in here too. I asked for robots, but it was like, what about ladies? You like ladies, right? Because I can't fault it. I'm, it's not exactly wrong. Here's some more robot stuff. I kind of like. Um, I kind of like this very thin, like, robot in a yeah. judo suit or something. I also like that his his pose. We I want to play with like unusual posing things. I think Kung Fu inspiration is fantastic, bro. Mm-hmm. I love I love the Buddhist monk up the right hand corner. I would totally play that character. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's he's like, is he a robot? Is he a? Um, I'm, I don't also, know. Like it just it has. I have this vision of like two like. Remember, I, I think it was one of the Dragon Gate uh, books uh, written by the young man. He, he's, oh yeah, Chronicles of Puritan, I think. Um. Uh, anyway, I think they made. I mean, anyway, the point is one of the things, one of the ideas I loved from that was the uh, the battles between the the armies is you have like some sorcerers on one side and sorcerers on the other side and you have an army in between and the sorcerers can't do anything because everyone's in a stalemate locked up trying to like because if they if they let mm. their guard down for a moment they will be immediately killed right um so they're all just like in this like standoff on top until the army manages to like push up there and, and kill the sorcerers and if they ever break down then your team immediately wipes out the other army because magic is so powerful right yeah yeah and this idea of like two sorcerers doing that and the stars they could just like teleport wherever so they they craft a space they teleport into that battle arena and they sit across from each other and are just doing shake magic at each other like ninja <laughs> and then one of them gets evaporated <laughs> and the other one teleports home and tells the king we won right right yeah yeah exactly it's it's like the um uh the penny arcade one where they're doing the the ping pong battle, right? And then the table breaks and they're like playing ping pong in their minds, right? For all eternity or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the battle of the minds. So that's kind of the masculine side, right? Of this like destructive uh, judo fighter monk kind of stoic character. But then there's the feminine side. And just like with the spaceships, right? There's the, like the masculine and feminine spaceships. There's also the masculine robots, like characters and the feminine robot characters. So of course it's anime inspired. It's got to be... Uh, very anime. some sort of yeah some sort of concert thing so i i'm not super happy with want, any of these images but this isn't quite i was really hoping for so star sage and specifically space wheats in uh, economy version has this kind of uh 
I don't know, like a rural idealism picked into it of like people living lives that are, are free from unwanted complexity. Mm. Um, and, and like in that space, a rich uh, giving and growth would be to me like the, like the enrichment of the thing that's already there. Yeah. Um, is the, is the feminine counterpoint to the, the destructive force as, as I would, that's how I would want to do this. Um, but also yeah. like uh, this, this is definitely some, uh, it's like fantasy anime vibes. Oh, yeah. this is even more concert. This so, feels like yeah, the concert it's thing. So, so the idea was like you can launch magic spells at each other to like destroy things or whatever. But you could also launch like characters at each other wrapped in magic spells to like, you know, blow stuff up. And then like the guy gets on board the other ship and is like running around with his katana, his laser katana or whatever. Right. Like right. causing havoc. But then you could also like the female characters are also like that where like, you send a delegation to the enemy city or something and they like throw this concert, but it's a magical concert because the music is part of the shape of the space. And so it like alters their planet so that then it's more hospitable to your kind of people instead of their kind of people, that kind of thing. Right. It it like changes the, it changes the shape of the location to be more fitting of yourself rather than configuring oneself to be a fitting of the location. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So it's this, it's the the opposite of the thing. So anyway, shorter terms for those things. (laughs) I like that aspect. We'll have to, yeah, we'll have to come up with some also, more terminology. Also, we talked a bit about groupthink and, like, how if you can get many people all casting, and that's a pretty common trope among magic. Sure, like, yeah, ceremonial like group casting or something. And, like, coordination is really important mm. in many different things. Anyway, yeah, let's, so let's the, the ideas of music and, and harmony there are, like, yeah, very resonant, resonance, too. Uh, here's some more just, like, I was trying to get it to make a spaceship, but it ended up making just, like, these giant walking robot things. Which is cool. I, I don't. This doesn't feel particularly. Uh, I I love that. If you go back, I love that upper right hand corner one. Yeah. I feel like that has that's got the swamp thing, which is from before. I yeah. also love that it looks like it can reconfigure itself. Right. It yeah. True. It has to be like walking plates and shifting doors. It could be more like Groot from. Uh, oh sure. Galaxy. Yeah. Where it's like it's making organic shapes, and that's what might be really hard for the robots to do. And now you have this space mm. and you have a journey and you're like from the robot clandestine and you have to figure out some way to travel to this very organically shaped environment. Yeah. And interact with it in, in some productive way. Right. Sure. Whereas the bottom left is just badass. Anyway. Yeah. Isn't it? It's like, it's, it's almost like very total annihilation slash. Uh, yeah. Krogoth kind of, kind of thing. Krogoth. Yeah. It feels very Krogoth. <laughs> and here's some more spaceship ideas. Uh, I feel like of any of these, maybe the bottom right one is is the closest to what I kind of had in mind. But uh, I, I, I also know. like the upper right hand one. It's, yeah, it's very yeah. It's like they're triangles. They would not go to the swamp very easily, but you know. Oh right, yeah, yeah, different, yeah, and and again, like different spaces may be more suited to different specific configurations of spaceships and stuff. Right. We talked about like space wheat cargo. You can keep rolling, but you talk about. Uh, yeah, so that's, so that's all I've got for for um, Star Sage at the okay, moment. Fantastic. Well, why don't you pick the next one? All right, uh, let's see. We're going to go... Um, let's go to the destination. I don't think we've talked about this much. I don't think we have talked about this, but I, I, I feel like I have intuition already. We'll see if I'm right. <laughs> okay, but. so so the destination was, it was a, an idea that... Um, some of uh, my brother and I and, and some of my friends had when we played Mist, and so there's all these um, puzzles and mm. like yeah. you travel around looking at stuff and there's these mysterious machines and like how do you interface with them and, and what do you do and so it's like a it's a classic um, puzzle game kind of thing, but in meditating on it I was I was thinking like part of the puzzle is spatial of course right so it's like um, Assassin's Creed, right, where you can traverse over anything, and so maybe, like, there there would be three routes to get to the solution to any puzzle, right? There's, like, the uh, traversal mm. route where you can, like, climb on stuff and, like, find a, a way in. There's the puzzle route where you can figure out the solution, find the key, un- decode the cipher, you figure out how you reverse engineer the machine or something like that. And then uh, there would be the, uh, like, the brute force route. Uh, 
approach. And it always bothered me that there's like this, you know, this wooden door and it's all rotten looking, but you like, you have to go on this crazy journey to go and like right. find the key for it when it's just like, well, why don't you just kick it down? It, is that a solution? Right. And there's a bunch of rocks lying around, right? It's like, pick up a rock and just like bash that door down and then we're okay, done. I want to I wanna spitball something. Let's get it. Yeah. So, uh, those three things. So uh, uh, it's, if I if I try and abstract them way up to just mechanics instead yeah, of yeah. like, traversal right mm -hmm. if you replace that with like at the if you abstract that all the way up to the user experience i i see dexterity right it's like how fast and quickly and precisely can i do this platformers ddr okay uh, twitch shooters are sure. all kind of in this space okay um then the middle one is is like investigation and information it's puzzle solving it's like getting the right thing this is like any games that you've played that have an associated wiki where people are creating <laughs> tips. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, or all the right. Zachtronic games where all, like, engineering right. kind of stuff. Right, engineering and design stuff. So, like, we're over here in, like, the, like, it's an information puzzle, mm. which is where I think a lot of Star Stage could be really fun there. Um, and the last one I would describe as grit. And this I would describe both as brute force, but also, like, if you're going to sit there, you can literally just punch the door for an hour, and then it will break. <laughs> <laughs> and like so there's like there's this whole i don't determination with this side of thing but there's a whole determination thing with like uh korean mmos are all about the grind and mm. just like you, you, if you want to level up you kill ten thousand of these things <sighs> right and then you're and like so the, the grind is a is like a, a some people really like that in a game mm. and you might want to have options that determine like well you can just pick up a gun and and fight down the whole army or you can like <laughs> beat at this thing with a sledgehammer or some sort of some sort of it doesn't take a high skill cap but if you're going to mm. put in the time then you you can get the reward anyway right right so so that's kind of the destination feeling it's um it's like ancient ruins and uh and obscure machines and uh interesting things to climb on and uh you know, yeah. trying to find the best path through. It's like a it's a puzzle solving game. Even traversal and brute force is still a puzzle solving game, right? So it's like this idea yeah. of. Um, did you ever play the dig? I think I think maybe you did. I uh, did. I watched watched some of the dig. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But same kind of idea of like this uh, this kind of point and click, uh, but a thinking man's point and click adventure game, maybe. Right. Right. Mixed with like Assassin's Creed climbing on stuff. I love the the top right thing here. Whatever this this building machine thing is. Yeah, this is a, like uh, it's got yes, a lot of different. Yeah, I feel Tomb Raider, Tomb Raider. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and Tomb Raider kind of thing. The puzzles were never super complicated, but they were very gratifying because you're like, oh, I jump and swing over here and I hit this button and you feel very accomplished. So. Yeah, yeah. So there's no, yeah, there's no reason it couldn't be a combination either, right? Like maybe the best path is, you know, do a little of this and a little of that. So that kind of stuff. You could stuff. you could lock uh, your rune your rune decipher into this game pretty easily. Right. Yeah, I was thinking about that with like um, puzzle pieces or or the um, from the witness, right? That that kind of um, yeah uh, grid trace the witness puzzle. So I, here's I some more. The, like a Stargate. No, oh, keep going. So Stargate yeah. rotational stuff. Yeah, like, yeah, lining up the the um, tumblers, tumbler uh, decoding, yeah, lock tumbler picking. Decoding was like, yeah, the, the, there's also those puzzles with the you have to get the car, the slide puzzles, right? I don't know if I've seen. Oh, oh yeah, 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 uh, yeah, like um, yeah, yeah, unlocking right. space and organizing right. stuff and right, spell right. word, but like sliding tile word. puzzles. Yeah, Tetris pieces. Good luck. Right, right. Okay. So like stuff like that sounds. Uh, bottom left also here was just like very evocative of, of like, I don't know. That's what I that I felt like that was what I was going for. You know, it was like yes, yes, that it, kind of a space. It's kind of like a little bit strange and wondrous, and you're exploring both what the space is like while also discovering what things like are, what are doors and what are walls, right? Mm, mm. Very cool. Yeah, and what's an interface and. And what's a machine, right? Is this is this just a, a complicated door, yeah. or is it a, you know? Right. So this got all the traversal energy to me. Yeah, yeah. Especially the the right to. 
Yeah, doesn't that, isn't that fun? It's like you could have some sort of vehicles that you're using, maybe, and they like go off the ramp and jump off your your quad cycle onto the wall or whatever. I don't know. Like, there's no reason that you have to lock it into um, to actual physical interface. Uh, so many games are like you drive your character around like an RC car, and I right. feel like there's a lot of space for like your character walks into the space you want to do thing X and your character like points at the thing and is like, Oh, I could, I could get up there and you'd say, go for it. And then the character does the traversal, right? Like, you, and it could still be cool because it's like, that's what you wanted to do anyway. Right. Yeah. So of... somehow leave, let the, let the person do the problem solving and then let the, other... so if you want to play a game that's low in dexterity, right. Um, right. But still high in complexity. It'd be really nice to be able to do the part where you just you just tell it how you would do it, yeah. without actually having to do it yourself. Yeah. Um, which again removes the fun for a whole host of people. Which right. again, right, right. But you don't. But you don't have to use those systems, right? Like you could, right. you could just play with that turned off and and do all the the twitchy stuff yourself. Right. But uh, it's the same as is like story games where you just want to experience the story. You don't want to have to go through all the. All the stuff, right? It, you should be able to just skip all the combat encounters, right? If you want to experience the story. You paid for the game. Like, why do you have to do all the combat encounters? And so I, I feel like the same thing is true of, of all aspects of a game. You should be allowed to skip the parts of a game that you're not interested in. Like, it's not up to the game developer to teach you a lesson that you need to learn, right? It's like, I get to choose the lessons I want to learn. This is a game I'm playing. You, you know, get out of my way and let me do the thing I want to do. Right. It's lesson. You are you are embedding like a toolbox in all of the fledgling. I get to the part yeah. of the fledgling concept. It's like whenever you give someone a tool, you should also give them like whenever you give someone experience, you should also give them the tools to make that experience. Right. Um, they, right. They might have a better idea about it than you do. It's like this. Yeah, we can keep rolling. Yeah. yeah. And pipes and pipe fitting and yeah, it kind of clocks and, and mechanisms and things. Yeah. Right. It would do really well in steampunk. That would be. That would be another fun place to yeah. play. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So that's all I got for for the destination. Uh, uh, kind of an older idea. Next? Hmm? Do we do warmth next? Warmth, yeah, I, absolutely. That's one of the... We've talked about it a bit, but I do get it confused with uplift, which I'm probably the, the most... Well, hopefully, hopefully after this, you won't get it confused because the imagery yeah, is, is very different. So uh, warmth is a game about engineering spaces and in uh, and conscious environments so like the entire environment is has not not necessarily uh, okay, the so environment as a whole but like each element in the environment has a consciousness and it directs its attention toward things it's like attention management almost it's, i guess it's a game about marketing really when i say it that way but <laughs> It's okay. it's like, Got you know, it. the water pays attention to the shore and the trees pay attention to the water and the rocks pay attention to the rocks above them. And so and all of that attention is kind of flowing through the game in a mechanical way that's called warmth. And so then your character can go to places and uh, places of high warmth and, and kind of gather the warmth into themselves. They can paint pictures of the locations. Um, it's kind of east shade in that way. Uh, but like you can paint a, a picture of the location and then you bring that back to your house and then like that picture acts as a portal to that location so you can harvest the warmth remotely through the image um mm. and then there's a whole so underworld game like you do all this while you're awake right and then when you fall asleep all of the locations that you've visited are there in the dream but they're all like disassociated and jumbled and so you can bring those together in the dream world as well and that's a way to engineer warmth flow and stuff and yeah, so it, it's very, uh, it's very kind of dreamlike, I guess, would be the way to to describe it. So, can could you, could you uh, also play a game of harvesting warmth from place? Because warmth is like complexity and attention, and like how much this thing is valued to be the way it is. I think we talked a lot about this when I was drafting that first procedural model. With, mm. uh, we're going to do breadwinner. Yeah, yeah. Talk gen for the island, and we talked a lot about when things fall out of the simulation. If you're in a node and then you zoom back up, what in there is the same, and what what's going to be regenerated because it wasn't uniquely important. 
Mm. And that idea, you told me at that time, I believe, that that was kind of what warmth was about. It's like the things that are going to stay, that are resilient to being like a simulation moves far away from them. Um, yeah. And don't get dumped if they have enough warmth to keep them alive and the cold, dark of the <laughs> observing them directly again yeah. also keeping the picture is going to force that there's like a way to uh anchor it well. yeah yeah it anchors the thing in, in the reality i love yeah okay i think i'm back on board i think i understand what this is now this is actually kind of ben's idea this is ben's kind of brainchild is warmth um yeah so i'm, I'm trying to do it justice uh or i'm gonna have a discussion with him later maybe we'll be together maybe it's just he and i but uh we may talk about warmth more at that point but uh, here's like a dream world kind of idea. I love here how the how the clouds are also trees. They're they're like they're the same form, right? And then there's also the forests, but like the whole thing also has that same form. It's, it was very. I cool love part. the high contrast in detail too. There's like mm. clearly something. A lot is going on over there, right? In that section, and that's like it mean clearly portrays it like this is a high interest location. This yeah. is a world map. Like, yeah. Be able to click on that. I think. Um, fractal complexity was one of the one of the seeds that i use for a lot of these images which tends to produce results that resonate with uh, for obvious reasons with fledgling with the fractal idea um and they also look like mushrooms right like it's like a mushroom tree cloud shape i was like oh that's really cool um a lot of this was inspired by uh, rococo delft porcelain designs and so these are some like because a lot of the like the image on the plate, right, is that is the location that you went to, and so you'd like be in your house, uh, you'd be in your your uh, Swiss manor or whatever it is, and uh, and then inside are all these you know these things hung on the walls, these like you know uh, Prussian blue plates hung on the walls with all the locations that you've been to. Great, I love uh, warmth and destination are are close friends. Hmm. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, they're all they're all kind of close together. I I feel like um, warmth has a lot to do with uh, with endless knot as well, which we'll we'll touch on hopefully Again, soon. Again, another one. I don't think we've actually talked about. Yeah. All right. Well, so I'll I'll skip through these quickly here. Here's in like a glade with all the you know like the warmth is is kind of circulating in this space and amplifying itself. Right. Uh, here's some more ideas of like your house or whatever. Um, Maybe like a castle. Uh -oh. I think I lost audio. Hold on one second. I can still hear you, so. And I'll keep talking. Uh, yeah, so that's like very, uh, and we're back to the start. See all the different elements here. You've got the water, you've got the trees and the, and the plants. Uh, you've got the clouds. I, I don't know if clouds are really a part of it. Can you hear me again? I could hear you before. Yes, but I, I couldn't hear you anymore. Ah, uh, okay. I, I can hear you now, so we're back on we're back <laughs> online. Uh, I was just saying that uh, I like the uh, the idea of your house maybe being a castle, depending on how you want to build it, right? Because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of user input into all of these games. Right. Well, schooners definitely live in a castle. That's <laughs> always fire doors. Sure. Well, and like here's a castle mountain. It's like you could transform the mountain into a castle. I don't know. So anyway, warmth. Um, since we talked about it, let's talk about endless endless knot yeah. next. So endless knot was uh, a concept I had. Let's see. Let's see if we can find something evocative. Uh, again, pastoral kind of imagery. Um, this kind of fractal complexity. This is more Celtic inspired with Celtic knots and kind of thing. That's what endless knot comes from. But um, I, I, I was thinking about the, the interplay of the masculine and feminine, the interplay of the forest, the field and the town and how like in different stages of life so that, so you could think about it maybe as, as a, one of those Celtic knots with the three strands, but um the vertical axis would be it's going horizontally the vertical axis would be the forest the field and the town and then the horizontal axis would be time but it's not time in terms of uh linear time it's time in terms of time scales so it's like at the personal scale at the like at the um the week or the month scale 
at like the you know the lifetime scale and the civilization scale kind of thing right like a log a log of log scale time scale scale (laughs) anyway so so that was kind of uh what i'm thinking about with endless knot and like playing with ideas of altering the altering the structure of that It, it kind of um it kind of played too with uh something we had talked about a while ago with like the uh the medieval it was like a medieval node fractal node based simulator kind of game where um i'm not exactly sure i think it was mostly just trying to trying to wrap our heads around the, was that the bread- systems i'm thinking about breadwinner but is it are you thinking about yeah it was it was like a proto breadwinner i think we were discussing okay um but instead of altering, instead of like going to a town and buying a sword and then going to a dungeon and like slaying a monster, um, right. you would you would alter the structure of the endless knot itself that underlies the reality of the game world, so that the kind of hero's journey adventure was more prominent in the masculine space or more prominent in the in the the personal time scale or something like that. Right? You shift the thing around a little bit. And so that then the the kind of stories that emerge from that setting are altered. So it's 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 more about like altering the underlying structure of the of the game world itself rather than altering specific elements of it. This actually brings up something really interesting. If you could jump back to the the chart real quick. Yeah. Oh oh, oh the yeah. Yeah, this one. So I have always thought of the economics and trade as how. Uh, like that has transactions in it mm. um, rather than just game states. So, so to me, the, the, like how I would think of it, I would put destination outside of economics and trade, right? Because there isn't any transactions happening. You're just going and exploring and moving through these spaces. Mm. And then I would put Star Sage up in economics and trade, not necessarily like I would just it replace economics and trade with like transactional. Sure. Right is kind of what i was thinking transactional like, gameplay or something it's more like you're thinking about that the it's like ecosystem are these things doing exchange in some other way yeah um, yeah maybe that's I don't, I don't know but yeah i and yeah i see what you're saying like economics and trade is more like um discrete transactional kind of thing and then maybe there's a what I was thinking about. Yeah. yeah maybe there's another aspect that's like um yeah like like you said ecosystem or or systematic um like uh symbiosis maybe like a an idea yeah. of this uh this ecological symbiosis right okay yeah that's cool great let's keep rolling so yeah and let's not uh hear some like just kind of trying to explore the idea of this game that's about the structure of not just the society or the character but the, like the whole world um uh, the interplay of like all the different craftsmen, right? Like maybe this is a map of the different, uh, the different craftsmen in the game and how they all like feed into each other and, and stuff like that. I don't, I don't know that kind of idea though. Uh, I don't know if you played the board game brass. Oh, I've heard of it, but I've never played it. Yeah. So brass Birmingham has one of these most most beautiful maps I've ever seen. It's so nice. And it's got Mm. all this, like, it's it's showing you all the trade and canal routes, and it's dense on one side and loose on the other, and that means something as far as, like, and it's got a lot of information on the game state that I, like, that feels like it it matches here. Yeah. So, and part of it is, like, in the in the field there's a lot of trade going on right there's wagons carrying stuff and right. there's all the people the farmers bringing their goods to market and all the the people traveling from the uh, from town to town through the fields right so it's like the fields are not only production like the production isn't really the point the production happens there but it's like it's part of nature and so that the personal uh, civilizational side of the interaction is trade through the fields right and then in the town there's craftsmanship so I, I had trouble getting it to like show craftsmen making stuff, but here's some some things that look like they were made as crafts. Uh, but like in the town is like all the all the work, like the human kind of work that happens, and then of course in the field is the um, not only is trade, but is also this idea of festival. And here I think is is maybe what you were thinking um, as far as the Star Sage, like the feminine uh, aspect of of society 
words like this um space more suited for ourselves yeah yeah we're we're like not only is it a place where plants grow but also where like relationships and and uh, human interaction grows as well and then in the forest of course there's the hunt and uh and how to how to properly take uh, what you need from the forest without being injured yourself and things like that. So there's like also this aspect of going out into the forest. Maybe there's like some herbalism kind of aspects too, where the, like the masculine goes out into the forest to hunt and the feminine goes out in the forest to gather. Uh, I don't know, some right. aspects there. I'm noticing kind of a fundamental, an odd thing that seems to have occurred in this game, given that it doesn't actually have time in it, <laughs> is that every system that you're producing has to be a fully balanced system. So like, you you have to you have to go to the forest without you have to interact with the forest in a way that doesn't destroy your society and also doesn't destroy the forest right isn't that i i i love that yeah i'm glad that came across yeah, yeah. so that's uh that's endless knot um yeah it's like it's like creating it's like per, creating altering the the permanent game state yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's almost like altering the procedural generation engine. Let's let's jump over to uplift. I feel like we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have interesting things to say. About yeah. Point. Okay. So here's uplift. Uplift is uh, one of the first concepts I had for for uh, a game, and it's like it's like Minecraft. Uh, I worked on Minecraft a little bit, and so and I I love the idea of this very discretized world where where you can. It's not this smooth, continuous kind of organic thing, but it's this very digitized, discretized space. But instead of um, instead of uniform a uniform distribution of of uh, di discrete voxels, I was thinking more like nested fractal of voxel sizes. So you'd have some voxels that are very big. You kind of see it in the bottom right hand corner. I tried to tell it to do like fractal voxels, but Midjourney isn't quite sure what to do with that. But like these big towers here could be individual voxels that that the game is using and so you could be playing as so in in uplift you can play as individual characters you can play as civilizations and you can play as the landscape itself uh you know like moving things around uplift of course is like a uh, you know a mountain but you could also do it like a rift valley or something um and so you can play at all these different scales because the voxels themselves are nested in scale so that there's this yeah. Well, you, yeah. What do you want to say about uplift? Yeah. So one of the things uh, it's it it captures it's everything I remember about it was like it, it captured time time happening. So you're 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 scooting through time and watching something um, uh, take place and like what where we're trying to grow and cultivate, right? So to me, it's like it's not like a farming simulator, but it's, it's more like we talked about was like what happens if I bring the lava up higher into this valley and add a bunch of heat, right? And yeah. then it's like and now now let's see what grows when I alter the state from the left hand side of the mountain to the right, from the top to the bottom, and how that like pushes out and influences everything else. Which again uh, like they and the, to me the idea of uplift was always about how can I take this space that is low complexity and high potential and like bring up, grow out, uh, cultivate, and, and like enrich until it's it's the thing that I want it to be. So I can grow out my vision out of these building blocks, and then you can get into more complexity. It's like, oh, I've, I've managed to make a place that's really good for humans or for swamp people. Uh, there's mm. Swamp people are here. Like, let's get in there and let's like let's bring out more. Um, and it's it's not warmth in the sense of getting it your attention in the in the game mechanic sense but it's more like you're giving it your deliberate attention in a, in a as a user interface right and like we want to give people the ideas that like the tooling to like induce what they're what they want to have happen anyway so like ecosystems is i would love to do simulation about that we also talked about the idea of like having um we don't have to render it discreetly so like it yeah can be, especially as we get to a place where procedural generation and content generation from AI is getting like mushed together which is kind of cool mm. you can have it like we get over to jackal star and like the uplift voxel structure is how i'd hold the data on which we then are generating procedurally off of those kind of those, 
Right. But we'll get to that. Anyway, yeah. Super. Very. Very. This is one of the ones where I first started conceiving of like the game mechanics of trying to figure out how to make these into mechanics. Mm. And uh, they got distracted somewhere along the way, but we should definitely come back. Yeah. Yeah. It's still. It's still waiting. Um, I like this top right one where it's got these pillars, and I, I I was thinking of these as like maybe three mountain voxels on top of each other, right? And that's all that the game is storing, and then it generates all this stonework and stuff uh, dynamically. And you, of course, you could go up there and like individual interact with the individual stones, but it's not really going to alter the shape of the mountains, and so the game doesn't track like trivial interactions like that, uh, or or maybe it throws them away after you've gone some distance in time or space or whatever. Right. Um, also, like, the idea of generating old cities and ruins and things like that. Uh, you know, towns. Um, this is very... I really want, a thing I'd love to do in Endless Knot sometime is to be able to tune it so it generates not a society, but it generates an ancient society. So it's a thing that's no longer actively interacting. It's still in balance, but we can show that it... We can, can leave traces that it used to be there yeah yeah where it all makes sense it's like oh here's the forum where they discussed their politics a thousand years ago and here's where they right. used to bring the grain into the market kind of thing right yeah yeah exactly where, where yeah where you you extrapolate backward maybe from the ruin you're like okay well here's the ruin and then the game extrapolates backward into okay well what details would i need in order for this specific ruin to make sense in this environment was was uplift big on so we have the back justification engine and we have the forward simulation engine. My understanding was Uplift was pretty strongly grounded in forward simulation and not really in the back justification. Um, yeah, I I feel like you need both for the kind of fledgling thing. So so uh, people familiar with Dwarf Fortress, Dwarf Fortress is all forward simulation and most games are all forward simulation. But I feel like in order to get, um, get away from slavery to initial conditions that you can or or in order to allow players to express like i want a house like this generate the rest of the town and the history of the civilization in order to justify why it's like this right because right. otherwise it's just either either you're a slave to the initial conditions or you uh you have stuff that doesn't really make sense with its surroundings it's it's it, at dissonance with its context right um, but but yeah, I, I think it's more about forward simulation than than some of the other games are. Uh, I was trying to get like a picture of somebody traveling, but they were all like people sitting somewhere. Um, some ideas for bridges and stuff. Uh, yeah, volcanoes we already looked at. Okay, so that's uplift. Is there anything else you want to say about uplift? We've got to keep moving here. Uh, no, that's that's one of them. Yeah. I uplift sits underneath so many of the other games I'm most interested in making. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I'm, I'm glad. Uh, let's see. We talked about warmth. Let's talk about Twin World. Oh, sure. So well, I don't know what this means in the fledgling context. Right. I, I never yeah. World made, but. So uh, let's see. How am I going to do this? Let's bring in the Zarth. So Twin World is. Um, I think the easiest way to describe it <laughs> is that good? <laughs> yeah, the bottom right is what I was thinking of when I was thinking Zar. Right? Isn't that? Oh yeah, it's so fun. So, so Twin World is like um, a psychological game. It's a game about visualizing the eternal psychological space. Uh, hang on a second. Do you? Then we had a vector diagram. I wonder if I could find it somewhere. But we had. The, the outer fire on the top that's radiating energy into this world, and then this like giant crevice on the bottom. So the you know the, the thimble, not the thimble, but the anchor that from Inception that he spun. I forgot what it's called. Anyway, he spins the thing. So it's the top, and then the the world is like this this two this top that comes from this stone and air, and the stone is like rolling and ripping everything down into the abyss below, and then above there's this inrush. Of aether, which we and which is the space that holds all the things. Yeah. Fire, kind of like radiating and pushing energy into this world, 
and the two meet on this rim and disc around the edge where it gets evaporated and the two forces meet. Yeah, yeah, so it's like, kind of yeah, it's kind of flaring outward. It's right. it's like you can yeah. imagine like a blowtorch of of stone and a blowtorch of fire kind of meeting each other and at that at that like unstable balance point is the tree of life. Right. And it's it's supported by the heart of water. So one of the things that yeah. works to me about the world is that the water is a thing that's coming from some other space. It's it's the magic and mm. it's holding open this area between this endless wall of fire and this the adamantian eternity and it's it's created this little pocket where mm. life can exist in these large contrasts well, again very a strong theme with anything that we design is that it's got these these very uh broad spectra of, mm. of quality so you have like a fire to water hot to cold uh we we've explored Gradients, a lot of uh, yeah unsettling ideas that we first like that are showing up a lot of these places i feel originated with trying to think about twin world in in those two ways like mm. how does they express themselves differently so zarth zarth are the the deep the... yeah so zarth are the masculine uh it's kind right. of the masculine side so the tree of life i it's fascinating to me that in the uh hindu i think in the hindu tradition or buddhist maybe the tree of life is upside down so like the roots are at the top and the branches are at the bottom and hmm. and i took that idea with the zarth the zarth of the masculine and so i drew a lot of hindu imagery into the into the zarth kind of concept and the zarth live at the roots of the world tree and so to them the world is upside down right and they're, they've got all this like floating stone and stuff and like all these flying stones right. things but to them it's like falling downward it's not floating upward right because down to them is toward the air right this this void underneath anyway so there's like this whole masculine thing i'll just kind of like flip through these pretty quick here um this is like all the masculine cities yeah. and stuff uh all underground all you know in the stones and, and the zarth themselves are kind of like these dwarf characters um right i like the bottom right here where it's just like is it a dungeon is it a party is it a, a market what's going on there is it an arm? Yeah. Is it? Are they? Are they prepping for war? Right. Is it an invasion probably, force? Probably prepping for war at the market. That, <laughs> it's that like a, all those things at once. Um, and then on the other side, there's the feminine space. So the feminine, they're like living in the branches of the tree. They're up by the fire. They're very um, volatile and and quick. Um, so there's just some kind of like scales that I really liked about. Things. Yeah. The, the creatures at the top are much more ingrained in the moment, but also they tend to work on shorter time scales, both in their attention and their lifespan. Yes. And then the creatures at the deep are entirely focused on things that go like really long time scales and planning, and they're rarely ever in the moment. And right. the idea of the they're not villain present. of this big, a dragon that has clawed its way from the water, the air beneath, Mm -hmm. worked its way all the way up into the space and over thousands of years is all he's trying to he's trying to take out the world tree and replace it with itself right so like mm -hmm. long time scales and then we have these uh societies built up that uh, the dragon's always been there but as far as they like that's just anyway, yeah lovely. yeah it's a it's a constant it's yeah. uh yeah it, and it draws a lot on um archetypal imagery uh that you know yggdrasil gnawing at the root of the world tree and all that stuff uh, so more more Ooh, fairy kind of concepts. Like, yeah, it's really like surface level stuff. Right? Yeah. Yeah, where it's kind of, they almost touch, right? Where it's like the plants right. and the world they tree. The and... idea that they, they could, there was there was a, we, we played with a little bit of this idea of like an aquatic, because remember that the center is, is aspected by water and the water kind of flows down, but is buffeted out by the wind and kind of sprays mm. into the fire. Yeah. Mm. So in the center, there's this like stable organic thing around the world tree that's that's rich in water so we have this idea of these aquatic creatures that are both masculine and feminine and we could like explore ideas of, of interactions in that space mm. so surface level and pools of water was a thing yeah yeah and you can see the water dripping down here in the top right image a little bit it's uh yeah these are these are very fun uh I don't understand what the game is. This to me is more like a world in which I would love to put fledgling games, but it I don't understand what the game mechanic, what the mechanics of this game in particular are. Yeah, uh, we can explore it a little bit. Um, 
there's also the the personality aspects. So this is something that I've I've been playing with for a while, and I feel like it kind of ties in with the the I, Twin World yeah, game. Sure. So like this is the pirate is is like openness. He's like high in openness because he's an explorer and an adventurer, and he's on a sailing ship, which at the time was like this high tech machine. Um, but he's also very traditional, right? He sings all the old songs. He's got the code of honor. He's got uh, you know all these. He knows the the, um, the the trade winds, right? The winds are always the same, right? So he's like he's very tied to tradition and and uh, and the originating spirit of the of the civilization. But also he's able to embrace the new and the stuff like that. So then there's a surgeon who's like very um, he's able to to do harm. He's able to do do injury in order to heal injury, right? So he's like he's very attuned to to agreeableness. Of like this person wants to be healed but in order to be healed he has to be very low in agreeableness for like they don't want him to hurt them but he's got to hurt them in order to get them better um the vampire is extroversion right so he's he's this recluse so he's super introverted but he's also throwing parties and like an, an an aristocrat and a socialite so he's super extroverted right so he's like this mass master of introversion and extroversion uh the werewolf is a master of neuroticism where it's like um you have to yeah. you have to be careful of where you are and who you are when you're around and and what time it is right you always have to be kind of worried that you're going to turn into a monster or whatever but also the the werewolf is there because he's the monster that's on your side so he's able to to be worried about the monsters outside so it's like this this um a master also, of uh, neuroticism i imagine that the werewolf in the werewolf state has very low neuroticism and is not concerned about fiddly details. Ever. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, so it's like this character who can have a broad range of neuroticism. And then, uh, of course, the billionaire who's a master of conscientiousness, who's like, not just like a billionaire, but like the billionaire uh, party guy, right? Where he can like relax and, and enjoy life and have very low conscientiousness and be like, eh, well, it doesn't matter right now. But also super high conscientiousness and like work super hard and be super organized when he needs like to be. The- conscientious capable hedonistic billionaire yeah yeah that image so anyway these are like the the five they turn out to be the five um erotic fantasy men in in women's fantasy that are also mapped i think well to the five personality traits so fascinating isn't that cool that's that's kind of fun yeah yeah so the idea would be like twin world would be as like we talked a bit about like um, negotiation games and uh, persuasion games and games where you're trying to alter the state of conversation or alter the state of a uh, like the communication game basically and the personality and communication go hand in hand and I feel like Twin World could be a uh, maybe I'll think about it as like a, as an outlet for all the communication exchange ideas that we had yeah, yeah, it could. I, I, I'm not certain what the mechanics are myself. I think that it's, uh, that it's probably. Uh, I probably haven't developed that as well as I could because it came from a, a web comic idea originally, and so it it is mostly about the world setting and maybe some of the story. But I think we can go there. So this is Gerbil Journey, huh? Gerbil Journey. Yeah. Gerbil Journey. So Gerbil Journey was originally Corridor. The idea was a pun on the, the the term corridor shooter, where you're like a guy running down a corridor and like shooting guys. And there's like, it's a super linear gameplay. But I was like, corridor shooter, what if you were a guy who had a gun that you point at a wall and pull the trigger and then you open the doors and there's a corridor stretching out from that, from that door uh, in the direction that you shot. So it's like a shooter that shoots corridors. <laughs> I should know that's where it came from, but amazing. Yeah, so so anyway, so this is like, and then like, what kind of a character would be in a world where you wanted to generate corridors? And like, well, of course, like a gerbil, right? Like the tubes and stuff, right? So then it was like, okay, well, this is like gerbils who are in this kind of little habitat. Let's see if I can find some gerbil habitat. So here's here's the cover image I came up with. Oh my god. Yes. Oh my um, god. Yes. They're great. Here we go. So like gerbil, some sort of gerbil habitat. And then, but they've got these um, robots that are taking care of them. And so the gerbils can be like, I want a corridor going in this direction. And then like, it makes a bunch of tunnels for them. Um, 
And so this is a game about like expanding your habitat of like the the uh, embracing the ideal of a prey animal, uh, where you're like, I want a place that's safe. I want a place that is protected from predators. I want a place where I have others of my own kind that I can interact with and there are resources I can use. And then I'm happy, right? It's not a game about like conquering the world or whatever. It's just like finding a good burrow or something like that. It feels a lot like Stardew or don't like... Uh, yeah. Oxygen not included. A lot of base building is like you're on the bottom of the food chain. Right, right. So, but then like the gerbils are also psychic and they've got the ability to communicate over space and time and they can travel back in time. And so like, or they can't travel back in time, but they can communicate back in time so they can ask for help from other gerbils yeah. and especially from uh, the gerbil emperor, the, the intergalactic gerbil emperor who's like attuned to all the gerbils. So this is kind of like Warhammer 40K, but like cute and fluffy and actually optimistic instead of like horrible right. and nasty they're like using their information from the future to make themselves really pleasant habitats both in the present and the, i think a lot of the gameplay was about finding like scouting out um various dangers to yourself and then and then using that information to make sure it never it never affects the the gerbil race right it's like yeah. getting ahead of any problems yeah yeah Right, exactly. And and so then the corridors are all about like it's kind of like a burrow, right? You're you're building these burrows and the and then there's the whole robot aspect of it, but it's tuned to, it's tied together where the robots are doing like the burrowing and the tunneling and there's all this stuff and then like research in the same way is, is envisioned as like tunneling through the intellectual space to get to a place where you can do something that you want to do. And so the whole thing is like tied together with the idea of corridors and, and um places that are designed to be traveled through. I remember a lot about the the corridors also being uh, dimensional corridors in different space, kind of as a prequel to hyperspace stuff we were talking about. With yeah, Star, yeah. Like, they make a corridor that goes really far in the future, and the gerbil like runs down the corridor, and then you get to play at the end of that thing, and then you find out, oh no, the the guys arrived with the giant fleet. So then you just scamper back down the corridor into the past. You can't bring anything with you except for the information, and you're like, hey. Uh, we need to do something to make sure that when we get to that future state that you we let's build a fleet and send it there beforehand or something like that and then you right. like scamper down the hallway to the present again or that future state and yeah. there's the waiting for you it's already arrived <laughs> yeah. and, uh, right yeah. and so part of the part of the game would be responding to the requests of other gerbils where right. they're like, oh, we need a fleet. And so then you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to go burrow over here and like, you know, get all these resources and, and research all this technology and build this giant fleet and launch it off into space. And then like in a hundred years when that, when it gets there, that other gerbil is going to be safe now because I did that thing. Right. Uh, so yeah, so the idea is of hyperspace. Now this is Jackal Star. So Jackal Star isn't on the map. Uh, it's not one of the one of these original ideas, but it's kind of this um, game about procedural generation, and uh, we don't have too much time to get into it. But I just wanted to show you some of this some of these images that uh, that we got here. Here's like layers of hyperspace ideas. Um, I really like the bottom left one and and kind of the bottom right one too, where there's like this all the different stable zones. Like yeah, stable zones within the hyperspace. Right, uh, right. So and then, like, all these structures that are that are tying the layers together. What dimensional space is, is the idea of you have a high-dimensional location, not just three-dimensional, but most... I think we were talking about 12, so, like, this yeah. four or space-time, and then we had another eight or so where we had various different attributes. But it could be abstract and customized to whatever you want it to be. Right. That would be the idea. Jackal Star was probably more specifically over in our favorite things of mechanics and building and pipes and things like that but you could, you could imagine hyperspace being across any of these axes hmm. and then the idea is we have a, a map that's in this high dimensional space and there's only particular pockets in there that are actually stable so you can't go to most places in hyperspace that doesn't actually make any sense there isn't anything there mm -hmm. and the idea is you would have these maps of what types of hyperspace is available given some sort of procedurally generated uh, know, like a scatter plot or faster than light or master of orion it's like these are the these are the locales available yeah it would be like little pockets of 
stable, stable configurations of, of hyperspace dimensionality. And uh, then you yeah. could build structures that are trans hyperspatial. Right. Uh, so there, like there's corridors, the most simple of which are, are corridors. Mm. Like chirp. Right, right. Yeah. So, yeah. so like, uh, yeah, gates and towers and pillars and, and pyramids and stuff that are like, one of the ideas was that I wanted to, I wanted to see if I could figure out a way to make the structure of the game result in the optimal structure being the kind of thing that you would find in an ancient ruin so that mm. it like it, so that the implication there being that the ancient ruins on earth are actually, um, cargo cult imitations of real hyperspace structures that people like saw at some point or, or like I, you know, experienced or they they used to be used as hyperspace structures and they could have been but like right you know, right or, or maybe they're the hyperspace shadow of real hyperspace structures in some other hyperspatial location oh, yeah, there could be a stable zone close by where they're doing hyperspace and we're yeah. just living like one one hop of hyperspace to the left right right so anyway, uh, structure ideas, um, more like uh, kind of hyperspace technology stuff. But I, I also it. wanted to be like also connected with nature and like the, the idea of natives that are living in these other hyperspace locations. And they're just like, they're not doing hyperspace travel. They're just living there like uh, not at one with nature, but like in tune with the, with the, the location. So uh maybe right. like be a good example of a, a native that you've come across right right so and then uh maybe some like nomads or like um some kind of yeah some kind of civilization that is doing hyperspace travel uh right. there's a lot the in jackal sage, star but the star sage ace is seems like the main character that you've imagined for the jackal star it's a first person perspective where you can go around and you have some sort of access to an individual craft and yeah craft yeah where you can transit hyperspace in ways that are unusual and then the rest of the things have to be done kind of not really like you have to build stuff so it can become an endless knot in a way so mm -hmm. you can get kind of like ecosystems or the, like not ecosystems but like um production loops or whatever you want like you want to fabricate a bunch of bolts because we've been playing too much Sabbath factory <laughs> and you, know, you want to set up you want to add their hyperspace gates in certain ways so that the, you have a continuous flow of whatever's happening and now you have an endless knot scenario where you have a balanced structure and that thing now we don't have to worry about the time that it takes you just like okay well uh, kind of in the in the idea of um what's a space game kerbal kerbal space program you yeah be like, forward to the interesting part right um, right yeah skip the part that's just the boring transit and get me to the the next point where i make a decision the next burn or whatever right right so the last thing that uh that we've got here is to see the sky and there's an article i wrote on project fledgling blog project fledgling.com i think um that goes into more details on to see this guy. Do you recall to see this guy? It's kind of like this. Read, uh, I we've talked about it a little bit, and I did read some of it, but that was that was a while ago, and I don't remember. So is, the idea is that you start in a habitat. Uh, there's like this um, this very caring AI robot system that takes care of you, and uh, you know like all your needs are met, and you're there. But then um, the habitat gets attacked, and so you have to like go on a tram to another habitat. And so, like, you're on board this tram, and you're, you know, going to this other habitat there. And right. uh, and then you get to the other habitat, and it's like, oh, it's all great again, and you can be there if you want. But it's like, uh, at your fingertips are all the tools you have that you would need to, to, like, take the tram apart. And it turns out that, like, the whole environment is made of machines and stuff. And so, like, the whole planet is this giant machine. And you can, and the the habitats and stuff are just, like, these these uh reserves for humans or whatever um but they're also outlaws like people who have escaped from the so you can like take your tram apart and turn it into like a, a walker or a, a, a an off-road vehicle or something and like go and find one of these outlaw posts or something and then you've got all this 
equipment that they've scavenged either from like digging in the ground and like pulling out all this ancient tech that's running the planet or like raiding habitats and stuff like that and uh you've got this hangar where you can build your mech and stuff it's like a mech warrior game kind of idea and uh but all of the technology is still running this ai thing so the mechs are super good at keeping you from getting hurt but if you actually want to go into danger and actually want to like shoot something or break something, you have to turn off all the automation and run it completely manually. And so then it's like this very mechanical twitchy game, almost like Quop, right? Where you're like flipping all these dials and doing all these knobs and like trying to get the thing to do the thing you want. And then like if it starts going bad, you just like hit the turn on the automation button again. And it's like, you know, jet packs and ejection seats and like getting you out of harm's way as, as quickly as possible. The AI won't help you do violence. Exactly. Right, exactly. Yeah, the AI is like completely there just to keep you safe. Um, and if you want to do anything that's not super safe, then you have to like shut the automation down and do it all manually. So it sounds like there's a couple. We talked about like disassembling things and finding out what their components are. That fractal complexity. Yeah, so yeah. Droid base where you can take apart the motorcycle and use this thing to play. Essentially. Um, that, that one scene from the, uh, Apollo 13. That, yeah, uh, yeah, the Apollo 13 uh, carbon dioxide scrubber scene. Like, out of this yeah. stuff, like, take it apart, put it together in a novel way. And, uh, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, so that's like, that's to see this guy. Uh, and that's all the imagery that I've I've generated for these games. Uh, we've got a few minutes here before you have to go to kind of talk about whatever you want to talk about. If you want to go and yeah, revisit some of this stuff, or big map, the big center of space, and let's talk about uh, a fledgling for a moment and how how all of these things are kind of one thing. Yeah. Um, right. So when I think about space wheat, and we're talking about the trade and commerce, the idea was that we have uh, because I'd been playing a lot of board games at the time, so it's like okay, we have these hex zones and we have these different products being produced and they go into our, our thing and then we want to transit them somewhere so star saves the idea of like how do we move from one place to another mm -hmm. like jackal star, star saves they use these mechanics of like shape and hyperspace and, and transiting across the dimensional space mm -hmm. uh, and it's like okay well then like what if i want to go more into like the the details of that let's add some more richness to to the terrain I'm experiencing from Space Wheat, where it's like, okay, what is this field like? What is this mountain like? So then we go over to Uplift, and we're generating and like bringing out more detail and explaining the case mm. of what. Well, also because every time you ask a question, the my understanding of fledgling is it both answers your question and then gives you a random scattering of recommendations for other things that are associated with it. It's like you might also want to buy such and such mm. um, it's like and then it's like, like the amazon uh, yeah. purchase suggestion thing right it's like right. oh Basically, many people also got uh, some ammunition with their shotgun like, okay right. that makes sense do you also want it's like well i don't i don't want that much detail about shotguns or maybe i do want more detail right right, right. um and then endless not you're setting up these places where are like endless not uh so that's to me the endless not was like well so yeah so like uplift is that is that finding justification for the reasons of it. Destination is like exploring other people's justifications for, for why this thing works and figuring out what the justification for this machine or this location or this setting is. Also, so Destination, uh, destination and Star Sage have two very different ways of considering transit, right? Mm. In Star Sage, it's a puzzle and you don't do the transit itself, but it's a different type of puzzle. It's just about like drawing the lines like city skylines. Whereas the destination is more about discrete, like getting past particular boundaries, mm. uh, more like an adventure game. So, like how they consider again, destination is much less aspected with space time, and which makes it such. I don't know. It's it's so cool to see. Like, I would love to like go to destination and play this game of like finding a location and be like, oh, uh, I'm playing destination. I'm exploring this thing. There's there's problems with. Uh, the terrain and the puzzles and the information and I don't understand what's happening and I, I finally understand this space and that opens up this idea of endless knot where I can now like I understand the knot of the destination and we can depending on the game I'm playing I can either 
um, I want to play uplift, and I want to use uplift mechanics to alter that state that I found to adjust it so it serves whatever goal I have, which, again, is playing space wheat, is generating more wheat or more spaceships. Yeah. So you're like, how can I bring in information from this space? How can, like, maybe I build a university here? Or it's like, how can I bring resources from this space? And then it's got this, this cycle that's pulling into my, my center economic character. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. And, and then and Twitter World would be a lovely place to do that. And now we have all the, like, the social space and all the people mm, that I'm talking about. Mm. That designation is not an empty resource with no conscious action. It's all populated with characters that have their own motivations. And now we have, you know, civ, uh, civilization-esque uh, dialogue and exchange. And we got to make sure we don't insult people and whatever. Yeah. And, and so many of these games, too, are kind of opposed to each other across from the center of fledgling, balancing each other out. Like Twin World is about personality and and individual characters and their motivations. And then Warmth is like that's all abstracted into this single characteristic of Warmth. Right. And like there's no personality to anyone. But that's what you want, because what you're trying to do is look at the attention itself. Yeah. Uh Yeah, that's yeah, that's about that's about. Um, so, uh, do you want to? I have a couple more minutes here before I got to run. Sure. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the future of fledgling and what those take darts? Yeah. Dark, what's happening next? I, well, I don't, I don't know. Like this is this is a project that I've been working on, uh, you know, with with you and my friends and stuff for decades now. Um, right. And it's not really a project so much as it's like a a way of thinking about games and a way of thinking about the world. It's it's almost like a philosophy, but it's not like a coherent philosophy. It's just like this trying to get outside of the huh. Most philosophy isn't coherent. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But like it's it's trying to get outside of the um, the Fortnite dance market of like authored content that's gated behind paywalls that's marketed to people and pushed down your throat and like i just have no interest in any of that i want to i want to be using the i want to be using the space and exploring it in a way that is is informative and and fresh and interesting and and helpful and that i can share with other people freely and and give them the tools to do it as well right so it's like this um the idea that instead of games being something that you uh that you experience passively like a movie like a game is something that you're playing and even the game creation part is something that you're playing while you're playing the game also there's a lot of ideas you have about contribution of ideas you have very strong ideas about intellectual property and i mm. think pretty core to the idea of fledgling is this idea of when you are working and creating within fledgling for yourself that is also contributing to the larger base for everyone else right? yeah like, yeah not again not that. necessarily but like by default it's it's feeding in um like the idea of spore right where like any creature you make goes on to the into the library of all the creatures that everyone can draw from right it definitely uh, mod. It, we're hoping it becomes a mod friendly game, and mm. also like want lots of people to build uh, games within this space for themselves. That if if they're properly built, I, I think like if we can build fledgling well enough, and the the tiny piece that I built over in the corner with with the island generation, yeah, we should be able to have uh, two different games pretty seamlessly merged together. So you can be like, give me these five different games people have made smack them together into one space and like create a space for me to explore using all of these mechanics and whichever mechanics are there in more or less abundance given whatever games you're trying to together. yeah yeah so, yeah the idea yeah. of of all of these pieces being so so each of the games is made up of a bunch of components that are that are combined to make that game what it is um, but then each of the games themselves are components of fledgling that can be combined to make fledgling what it is. And so, and because they can all talk to each other, you can, uh, yeah, you can, they all have their own, their own style of visualization, for example, but you could easily 
take the style of visualization from one game and map it onto the other game so you can be like, okay, well, I want to look at this as if I was playing, I want to play Uplift and then look at it as if I was playing Warmth um, and then interact with it as if I was playing to see the sky or, or whatever, right? Right. And very soon, like, I would hope that we have lots of, these are just like, these are our games that we have thought of to put in this space. Well, a lot of these are your games you actually put together to put in this space. But the idea is really to define the space and the mechanics and get that working so that we can very quickly turn it over and let people make their own spaces that we can then... Right. You know, yeah, yeah. Them. This isn't like, here are the games that, that you need to be familiar with to play Fledgling. It's like, no, these are like some examples of the kind of things that you could do with the Fledgling engine. It's, it's more of a game engine, I guess, or like a game ecosystem than it is of like a specific franchise. Yeah. And the only thing I really, I mean, the only thing I really made progress on building was like that kind of data structure for how mm. to store information mm. or how to store a particular type of some of the mechanics. So it was, mostly I was over in like uplift and endless knot space kind mm. of up there. Not, not a lot of, I didn't have the puzzles down yet. Sure. Um, but like world generation stuff. So we had like this this data set of like the game state and how you could modify it manually, mm. and then we had to slowly, slowly add on mechanics for the different ways in which you could modify the game state. And then mm. those game states, because they're all stored like fractals in their own dimensional space, right? It's like how much of it this is is vampire or not isn't really relevant if you're over there looking at space wheat. So why can't we just throw the vampire on top of the space wheat? And now we have vampire and space wheat aspected location and the game should be able to very uh, smoothly generate the procedural like outlet of that now we have a destitute town all of a sudden instead of a, a quaint one right right or or like a um what vampire hunter d was that the at the anime right where it's like the town is completely dominated by the vampire and he lives in like this huge onyx cube or something outside town and like right. all the city the city's got like crosses on all the, the all the rooftops now because they're trying to ward off the vampire. Right, just completely, completely suppressed them into the ground in the dust. Right, right, but but being able to because there's there's so much um, there's so much potential for the procedural generation tools, especially now with as I've kind of hopefully gestured at with some of this AI art stuff, like. There's no reason that, that this kind of technology couldn't be integrated into the, the pipeline for uh, for the procedural generation and then for it to also, the procedural generation to feed back into that so that it trains the AI to make better kind of content for the game. So it's just like all of this stuff could feed back into itself really quickly. And I feel like I feel like when I've been working on Fledgling, I haven't been trying to make a game myself. I've been trying to see where games are going to be so that I can see what kind of what kind of thing I'd be interested in in that space. So it's not like I'm making Fledgling and I own the idea and like everyone needs to get on board with my concept. It's like, no, no, no. I feel like this is going to happen and and hopefully here are some ideas about the kind of things that we could do with this technology once it it, it has kind of come to fruition. Once it has, has become a Fledgling, right? Once it is fully fledged, once it is taken off from the the uh, the nest that we built for it, right, and and kind of brooded over it and gotten it going. Hopefully, it's going to gonna launch off, and then like where it goes, I don't know. But these are some of the ideas that maybe it will go. Right. My my next thing that I would love to build. So I'm I'm kind of on the other end of this, where it's like I have a game I really want to make, mm, and I yeah. feel like Fledgling is the right place to make it. And you and I have kind of been talking back and forth about creating this because like i have i have a i have a game i want to make inside this space and i think the next big chunk for me though i, I haven't worked on it in probably uh, at least a year would hmm. be um, trying to get into the procedural quest building and and puzzle building so like getting it to make puzzles procedurally out of whatever dimensional space i have available to me yeah so i think i can make pathfinding problems and I think I can make like matching and sorting problems to be abstract enough that you can kind of like uh, embed them in whatever whatever nouns and verbs you have available. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's the idea. Yeah, yeah. So 
I, I man, I'm so I, glad I, we had this conversation. This this has been really fun. Great. I, I have some ideas, but I haven't been able to prove them out yet. And like, I need to get my little game pieces out and my my clean table and start <laughs> uh, making transactions between various agents on a board and see if I can figure out how to how to make that work. Right. Yeah. Anyway, well, I think you have to go. Game. Yeah, I'm going to take a call in a couple minutes, so uh, uh, when you talk to Ben, let me know, and then uh, we'll see what else we got. Yeah, we'll try to do another one of these soon. Uh, thanks for coming on with me, and thanks, everybody, for watching. And uh, Yeah, this is very exciting stuff. Thanks for, okay. for talking to me about it. Yeah, great, great 